So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm Chief Executive of the RSA, uh, as you, some of you might know. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's special lunchtime event. We're filming and live streaming today's discussion, so uh, hello and welcome to everyone uh, joining us online. The hashtag for the conversation, if you want to join the online conversation, is uh, RSA Future. Um, I'm delighted that we're joined today by Paul Mason to explore the big questions. I mean, the big questions isn't really, a, that doesn't really get it. You know, the huge <laughs> monumental questions uh, surrounding what will become of humanity in an age of unprecedented uncertainty and radical technological change. Paul, as I'm sure you all know, is an award-winning writer, broadcaster, filmmaker, former editor of Channel 4 News. His latest book, Clear, Bright Future, which I've been reading for the last uh, uh, week, looks at the forces shaping humanity's fate from economics to big data to political tribalism and explores how we can defend what makes us human in the machine age. Paul will start with the very difficult task of summarizing this incredibly rich book in 20 minutes, um, but I'm sure he'll only do bits of it, leaving the rest of it for you to find out about when you buy the book afterwards. Um, and then when Paul's spoken for 20 minutes or so, we'll have a bit of a conversation and then we'll open it up to you. So please, uh, to start off, join me in welcoming Paul Mason. Thank you, Matthew. It's always brilliant to be here, and thank you to you for coming on this incredibly sunny day. I hope there's still enough of it left uh, for you to do two things, enjoy a bit of the sun, and to vote. Um, <clears throat> we live in an age of technological euphoria and geopolitical doom, and both emotions are justified. This is a picture of Manchester. Not the picture of Manchester that you normally see, but it is the picture of Manchester that Manchester wants you to see. Um, that's the, where the BBC is, where Granada Studios are. It is, it is a nice slice of modernity. And it would be justified to look at that and, and to understand Manchester University and the Man Man MMU University are global centres of research in their own fields and to see the incredible vibrant population or young population of Manchester and say, I feel a little bit euphoric about that. The fact is, by 10 o'clock tonight, this region where Manchester exists could be represented in the European Parliament by a fascist, backed by uh, far-right American money, uh, the slickest fascist campaign you've ever seen in this country, um, if, we're not, if we're unlucky. Now, where do I point this to make it work? Where do I point it? Maybe I'll do it this way? No? <laughs> Go on, you never know. Go on, that's it. Technological euphoria up to a point. <laughs> if, someone, if someone wants to move my slides along, that's fine. Um, great, good. Well, that's one of the reasons we don't feel too euphoric. We're in bigger trouble than most people actually want to think about. We've got an economic system that no longer works well enough for everybody. Many people ask, how does my child have a better life than I do in the developed world? And can't, <clears throat> neither they can't come up with an answer, nor can the political uh, and technocratic elites that make the decisions. They don't have an answer either. So the economy. We have, as you can see here, evaporating consent for democracy, for the rule of law, and for the concept of universal human rights. And... A third crisis, again, not well enough understood, but there, is what I call the crisis of algorithmic control. Elites and states are increasingly able to use the vast asymmetries of power and information between them and us to not only know our thoughts and behaviours, as you will know if you use Google or Facebook or Amazon, it knows kind of roughly what you've been thinking about or writing about, but increasingly to predict them and therefore to control them. And this triple crisis of economic stasis, of falling consent for the old institutions, and for rising use of algorithmic and machine control of human beings, constitutes to me a, a whole, a big thing that we can link together. As I reported it, starting in 2008 with the Lehman Brothers crisis, morphing into the 2011 uprisings from Egypt to Spain to Greece, Occupy Wall Street, and now the attack on truth and the war on truth uh, being carried out from, by Vladimir Putin, 
Xi Jinping, and Donald Trump, I came to the conclusion that the deeper crisis is a crisis of the self. That the crisis of the neoliberal system has resulted in a crisis of the neoliberal self. Now, I should... Where's my thing gone now? Next slide. <laughs> when it comes, all go, hooray. Um, so, <clears throat> we may have to abandon the slides, it's fine. It, neoliberalism, for me, is the coercive introduction of, by the state of market norms of behaviour into all parts of everyday life. Michel Foucault, writing at the dawn of the neoliberal era, warned us what we would become, uh, entrepreneurs of the self, performative, as in when you go into the pret-a-manger, and it's, if you try to treat the person behind the counter like a human being, it's actually quite hard to get a coffee. If you go in along with the way they are programmed, it works. Increasingly in hospital as well, nurses and medics are asking you questions that it is quite obvious that the questions are programmed to go into a logic system, uh, and not questions that arise from the human interaction with you. And if you want to get that nurse or doctor's day over with quickly, and if you want to get yourself in or out, it's easier to perform. And I argue in the book that as the neoliberal system embedded itself into our lives, we increasingly conformed and performed into this kabuki theatre style of interaction. We became atomized. We became two-dimensional in the literal sense of homo economicus. For Mill and co, and homo economicus was a thought experiment. What if people only judged everything in terms of market interactions? But the selves we built to cope with the violent introduction of neoliberalism were selves that actually did, non-metaphorically, interact in this way. And I mean, a great example of that would be supposing someone in your town you know, decides that they want to build a new library. You know, from the local newspaper to the librarian to the, to the, 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 the local councillor, the question would be, is it good for the economy of Swindon or whatever? Is it good for the economy of Lee, where I come from, to have a library? We learned not to ask the question, is it, is it good just because we want to read more books? It's, it's almost become a knee-jerk that we, that we reduce everything to the homo economicus uh, form of, of questioning. But the problem here became, and Foucault warned us about this as well, that the outcome would be that we became eminently governable. And if my colleague at the front will move the slides on, you will see how, govern how governable we became. Just analyse that for a minute. Who has agency in that photograph? You may not be able to see, but everybody's just taking photos of him. There's one person with agency in that photograph. Hannah Arendt, who I have a critical relationship to in this book, too critical for the Hannah Arendt facility at the Bard College uh, USA, but uh, Arendt called this the temporary alliance of the elite and the mob. And that's what we're seeing all over the world. What the elite wants, and, and in a, a chapter in the book called A General Theory of Trump, I try to analyse the motivations and the material interest of those in the elites who have backed Trump. What they want is, can be summed up by one word, chaos. Chaos from which they prosper. If you are Renaissance Technologies, Robert Mercer, Trump's biggest backer, uh, to the tune of, uh, of, of, of millions, um, Renaissance Technologies has a machine that understands the world better than anybody else does. It's, it's a neuro-linguistically programmed artificial intelligence, and it can trade volatility better than anybody else. Ergo, the more volatility there is, the better. Steve Bannon owned Breitbart. Breitbart trades on fear and chaos. That's what it reports. All rapes in Sweden are migrant rapes for, for, for Breitbart. Um, the more, the better for business. And for the Coke industries, uh, they didn't back Trump, but they backed the Republicans in the last election. Again, you could say, what, what if you are an avowed anarcho-capitalist who believes the government should literally not exist, and that the survival of the fittest should literally govern everybody's lives, then again, what you want is chaos. And this guy, Trump, is just the wrecking ball. He is the chaos engine. But what do the mob want? What do the people... Um, 
holding up those, those, those uh, chanting the C word at Hillary Clinton and the rest. What do they want? Well, it, what they, when you interview them, and I interview some in the book, what they want is white supremacy, misogyny, homophobia, climate denial, anti, anti-vaccination. That's, that's their meat and drink of their ideology. But Arendt, in the full quote, says something I think we should learn from. She says about the Nazis. What the mob wanted and what Goebbels gave them was access to history even at the price of destruction. It's a a, a pregnant phrase. They want the reversal of history. The man I interviewed on the Trump um, inauguration who could not accept climate change, could not accept it because he was a, a cattle farmer from Tennessee. He says, if climate change is right, I have to give up my... I have to pay a tax. And if I have to pay a tax... My children don't get my wealth at the end. So climate change can't be right. And haven't you heard about the camel, uh, uh, camel uh, skeleton that has been recently found under the Antarctic? Uh, we are asked to be sympathetic to such people, to worry about the bleak lives that they live in flyover country in America and about their supposed poverty. But there's enough evidence in, in, in the book drawn from surveys that it's not poverty or bleakness uh, on its own that is driving people in this direction. It is... The desire to reverse history, just as Arendt predicted. But what makes it possible for them to win? As I say, the important thing about this picture is that we are looking at, at, a, at, a, at a state where only elites have agency. And my thesis in this book is that this is not an aberration from the neoliberal era. Trump himself is merely a national neoliberal. He is, uh, it, this is Thatcherism in one country. Because of the crisis of the global economy, it's become necessary for the elites to compete with each other using deregulation rather than to cooperate with each other using deregulation. That's what Trumpism, Bolsonaro, Orban, Brexit, to me, is. But what they are required to play on is a thing that neoliberalism itself created, which is, I, I call in the book, a folk religion of fatalism. New slide. Let's put it this way. Suppose I asked you to submit every decision in your life to an intelligent machine. Who you love, where your child goes to school, what you eat tonight, um, what the government should do. Suppose I said the government should take all decisions uh, only if the intelligent machine uh, says they're okay. Suppose I said the worst thing you can do with the intelligent machine is to tinker with it. Don't try and outguess it Don't try and um, manipulate its results. The intelligent machine will always outthink you and every other human being. Suppose I said to you, you'll be happier if you start to anticipate what this intelligent machine wants. What would you say to me? Get lost, I hope. Get lost, but worse. um, You know, in Anglo-Saxon, get lost. Um, But now just try substituting the word market for the word machine. Um, In Hayek's uh, economic theory, a market is a machine. It's a spontaneously emergent order. It thinks better than the human being. The government should not do anything that the market will not sustain. Um, It's all there. It's just the market was treated like a machine that knew better than we did. And it should be no surprise to us that we get people standing um, idiotically um, taking photographs of a powerful man who is going to destroy this system which has nurtured everything that they rely on. And that, why did we become so addicted to the idea of obeying the machine? Because it worked. The more you, you, more you did anticipate what the market uh, wanted, the happier you felt. Um, and it, neoliberalism worked for a while, but then it broke down. And we'll have the next slide. In 2008, the financial crisis and the financial excess nearly crashed the system. Of course, it was bailed out. Um, it was bailed out. I don't know if you remember at uh, the time we were all re- reporting it. Richard Koo, the Nomura uh, analyst, made the controversial claim, and, and he was probably right in, in, at the time, that this would take 10 years to pay down the debts accumulated in the boom. Well, no, we didn't pay down any debts. Household, government, and personal debt is now $57 trillion higher in the world than it was in 2008. And we printed $16 trillion of 
quantitative easing money in the world and kept interest rates around about zero and we bailed out the banks with state money. Um, as a result, you could say that the neoliberal system is on life support. $57 trillion goes a long way. $16 trillion of free money can be witnessed in every new coffee shop and every new trendy but slightly amorphous um, outlet for things uh, on the high street. Um, but you can't keep an ideology on life support. The human brain demands coherence. And as Will Davis of Goldsmith, Goldsmiths University puts it so well, since 2008, the neoliberal system has been literally unjustified. The, it, 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 its logic doesn't match its outcome. And so, if you can't keep an ideology on life support, what happens? It falls apart. And the next slide should be there. It's like a religion that no longer explains the world. Um, if somebody doesn't come up along with a new religion, what happens is people say, well, we need religion. Uh, what, what were the old ones? What were the ones we used to follow? And they were um, nationalism, white supremacy, colonialism, misogyny, homophobia, and the worship of powerful thieves. That's been pretty uh, strong in history, and it is strong again now. Arendt made this brilliant insight. There was a... There was a there was a, a, a furore around the Potsdam Conference in 1945 about whether the Germans were intrinsically fascist as a char as a with a national character. And Arendt, German-American, says, the problem isn't the German character, it's the disintegration of the German character that caused all this. And I think what we're seeing here is a problem of the disintegration of the neoliberal character. The aims of the alliance of the elite and mob are pretty clear, to roll back history so that men have greater power than women, that white people retain what W.E.B. Dubois called the, the wages of whiteness. You know, if you, so the, the pat, permit patty incidents that you may have seen on the internet where a white woman is always inevitably calling the police on a black person for being in the wrong place. What's the implicit wages of that white person is that sh should, should things go wrong, somebody's going to get shot and it's not going to be her. These are the realities that have been unleashed by this. The attack on truth is the other big weapon, and Arendt anticipates it. But it's even worse now, because in the 30s, when Hitler, Stalin, you know, Mussolini were rounding up typewriters and, and, and monopolizing the information, they literally did have a monopoly of information. Society was hierarchical. People had lived in, through war, through the hierarchy of war, and the hierarchy of the Taylorist and Taylorist factory and the Weberian hierarchy of Western society. We don't. We are a network society. We haven't, America, when it chose Trump, had experienced nine years of, of, of unstoppable growth. In the Super Bowl before uh, Trump's election, was, it was fronted. The, the, the halftime celebrations were fronted by Beyonce uh, with a troop of dancers dre dressed as Black Panthers. This is how optimistic... Uh, America had become, and indeed before Brexit, how optimistic we had become, if you so optimistic that we had no idea that uh, those of us who wanted to stay in the European Union were not going to be able to do it. There are other weapons in, t in terms of the attack on truth, uh, on, on top of that are the militarised states that have been created under the last 30 years, that's now in the hands of people who would like to use them in an illiberal way, and above all, the problem of algorithmic control, because the, the, the signal fact that, for me, brings together the anti-humanism of the right and the anti-humanism of the systems created by Silicon Valley is the problem of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Cambridge Analytica knew 5,000 facts about everybody whose information it was manipulating. You cannot hold 5,000 facts consciously in your mind at the same time about yourself. That mean, gives them the, the, the power not just to predict your behavior but to influence it. Famously, Trump vectored to four states, to black people only, one day before the election, adverts showing that Hillary Clinton is a racist. Better not vote for her. At the same time, nobody knew this because nobody else got the adverts. That's the power of algorithmic control. At the same time, all the analog things like the adverts on TV, Trump's speeches, speak to this issue. But it's only later that the, you find that the machine has been messing with people's heads on behalf of Silicon Valley and anybody who has the money to commission that kind of work. 
mucus and hypenes. What do we need to do in the face of this, for me, is to conduct a radical defence of the human being. It's hard, because we're not, up, we're not only up against the atomization we, we felt under neoliberalism, we're also up against a fairly systemic anti-humanism of, of the far, far right. Some, some research I quote in the book is, is pretty horrible. Um, uh, research among 500 alt-right members in America asked them to place their political opponents on a scale from chimp to human being with gorilla, Neanderthal man in between. You know, the ascent of man graphic. What's really interesting is the propensity of the hardest of the hard right people to dehumanise everybody. So not, for them, not only are Muslims and black people chimps, but also Democrats, also feminists, and also um, Republicans who don't support Trump. This is academic research, peer-reviewed, a really interesting piece of work. It, it convinced me that unlike in the 30s, when, the sci when so social scientists like um, Theodore Adorno and Eric Fromm, who I also co comment on in the book, were looking for authoritarian traits in personality, they, today we don't find it among the right. It's, it's the propensity to dehumanise, and we should have known this, anyone who has interviewed or listened to uh, a Holocaust survivor, I was lucky enough to, to interview... Marian Tursky, the Auschwitz survivor, two years ago. That's what the first thing they said. That what allowed them to do this to us was dehumanization. But this is a fairly systemic dehumanization going on. The real problem we've had, and I'm skip over this because of time. The problem, the problem we've had, and I deal with it in the book with some uh, with some confrontationality, um, is that is that the academic left did a lot of the heavy lifting for anti-humanism. Um, Foucault, who I admire, you know, basically said hum, hu, human is a social construct. It's, hu, humanity will be wiped from the face of history just as easily as a face drawn in the sand uh, if the conditions for it are removed. Um, and from postmodernism, we now have, some of you may know, and, and it's well worth engaging with the writings of it, the, uh, and the emergence of a systemic, uh, a sy rather systematic, post-humanist uh, social science. A social science which claims that we... The two figures in the here, the, the robot and the, and, the, and the robotic orb and me, are all basically machines. Um, you, you can pick up a, a book on any airport book stand. My fellow Penguin author, um, Yuval Noah Harari, um, telling us that we are already algorithms and that between determinism and randomness, there is no room for agency or free will. So that's a problem. We've... To go to the next thing, what to do, for me, is to find each other and act. Find each other and act. That's the thing to do. And, of course, politically, and this is a change for me from 2015 when I wrote Post-Capitalism. I think then it was fair to say the big problem for the left, the, the enemy of the left, was the global neoliberal elite, which had just smashed Greece and was losing control of its own narrative. I think not, no, no. I'm fully prepared to make an alliance with the, the centre, the neoliberal centre, for, ab, for the absence of doubt, to defeat the, the right, to defeat what is coming at us. I think we are going to have to do it. Uh, I think it will take us some time, longer than the time from 1933 to 1945, to actually remove this new thing from, the, the, from, from Western society. Um, but it's not just about politics. What we're looking at here with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, with Me Too, with Extinction Rebellion, is I think a spontaneous move from simple political action and simple demonstrative protest that makes the elites move, which is what Occupy really was, to a, a much more granular, granular demand for behavioural change. The behavioural change, for example, in the theatre is tangible. Uh, not only in the theatre, but in all drama schools, everywhere you go, uh, it, the, the, the effect of Me Too is still reverberating throughout. The way, for example, a director will direct a female actress, a female actor, the way that one speaks to each other, even what playwrights are writing is being affected by this. This, to me, is, is sub-political. It, 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 it exists on the level of moral and ethical thought and behaviour. And it's that that the book is effectively a call to action to engage in. The book says to defeat 
algorithmic control, to, to keep control of artificial intelligence, and to defeat the right, we're going to have to centre the defence of the human being on a theory of who humans are. And for me, influenced by the early Marx, that who humans are, are a biological accident, a, 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 an accident of, of uh, evolution, but nevertheless a, an accident which produces a species that is a cooperator, an imagineer, and a linguist in its species being, not as an add-on. And that gives me, that suggests to me there's a 50-50 or better chance that that species can liberate itself through social change, through technological advance and social change and human change, the change of the human being itself, what Marx called the, 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 mass alter, the alteration of human beings on a mass scale. So for the left, I think this also has to mean an engagement with moral and ethical thought. Marx used to laugh out loud at morals and why, sh why shouldn't he? You know, what, what use does Nancy and Oliver Twist have with morals? But, but the working class didn't laugh at morality. They constructed their own. Marx just called it class consciousness. But those who have ever <laughs> experienced working class self-imposed morality will know that it is a form of, I, I argue in the book, a form of virtue ethics. It's a form of ethics that asks you what is the good society we're trying to create and what kind of people should exist within it. I think... The other final thing I want to say is that for the left, the, the urgent thing is to leave behind one no and many yeses. The idea that we've got an opposition to something, but no proposal of our own. The centre's utopia has kind of died. The right's utopia is clear. The left must have its utopia. I'm an unashamed utopian thinker. For, with all the dangers that raises, and all the all, you know, 101 sociology tells you, you know, utopian thinking leads to the gulag and the holocaust and Hiroshima. And if you're really lucky, it will also throw in uh, the, the genocide of um, the indigenous people in Australia and Latin America. Uh, but it do, yes, it did do, and we need to learn from that. But the right has a utopia. This, as you may know today, you know, with the election, it's a battle of utopias. If we don't have one, if we don't have the idea of a good society and how we're going to get there then it is the incredible power of those old, visceral, anti-human, biological power-based ideologies will, I'm afraid, win, and we lose the, we lose the enlightenment. Um, and the last picture on here is a snowflake, um, and when it comes up, uh, I'm quite proud of, the, of being continually labelled a snowflake by the alt-right. Um, to me, just like the word queer or the N-word for, for black activists in America, it can, used rightly, ex be thrown back at those who want to oppress us. It is, it's something that's unique, temporary, quite beautiful, melts easily. That, that's what human beings are. And I think that the, the kind of alternative title for this book, which nobody liked at the publishers, but I did, was The Snowflake Insurrection. And, and that's what I think I want to convince you to join. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So, um, so one of the reasons I found the book uh, uh, so fascinating, and there are lots, but, but it, it, it is that in a sense, it, not only is this not a book primarily about how do we govern, um, uh, uh, nor even just how do we live, but it's really a book about who are we. And I think that's right. Uh, I, I think that too rarely does politics connect big issues around how we run society and economy and, uh, with an account of who we are as human beings and the assumptions which underlie that. And, of course, you know, actually what neoliberalism had was it did have its account of who human beings are, homo economicus, which kind of un, 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 undergirded it. And you are, I think part of what you're doing is, is saying that the left needs to have its own compelling account of, 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 of what human beings are, what we're made of. And, and I want to kind of explore this kind of humanism theme that's yeah. in the book. So th th one of the things that was interesting in the book is that, is that a lot of the books I read around the kind of crisis of liberal democracy or Trump or Brexit or whatever, try very hard to be sympathetic to the people who voted for Trump. They try to, uh, very hard to be sympathetic to the people who will vote Brexit today. And people will vote Brexit for various reasons. Mm. I'm not lumping them all together. But those who will vote Brexit because they really think Nigel Farage is great. Um, you're, you're not really in the business of doing that. I mean, you're quite hostile to them. And I think see them as people who, I'm kind of interested, do you see them as people who, who's, who re realize their interests are 
being threatened and therefore fighting back? Do you see them as people who are suffering false consciousness? What, you know, what, what is your description of those people who are going to vote Brexit today? Well, first of all, to, to not lump them all together, and certainly not to try to, to unnecessarily otherize them. But for context, for me, since 2011, I've been trying to convince the left that the agent of history is not what they thought it was. That, that, that it, you know, the orthodox Marxists thought it was the, or the, you know, the industrial proletariat. I think, like the new left, it, that, that wasn't proven by historical experience. I, I come from that background, and they, they wanted more than reform and less than revolution. What they wanted throughout the existence of the industrial proletariat was control, and when they fought for it, it they tended to get it. I, like Manuel Castells, like others who are influenced by what is called post-operaist, post-worker Marxism, believe that the agent of history is the networked individual. Uh, and what does that mean? It just it, it means we are we are exploited by capitalism through several streams. Work was the, the the stream through which my dad's generation were exploited, but we are now exploited through our credit cards, through our cell phones, through our co-creation of brands, prosumerism, uh, through that. Now, to me, the if you then want to lift the idea that nevertheless we have a an agency that that that, that says. It would be a good idea if we certainly created a better capitalism with more control for us, and ultimately, if we transcended capitalism, then it, you, your next question is, how do you create the equivalent of class consciousness? How do you equi equate the, create the equivalent of this wider and more diffuse set of human beings understanding that they have a common out outcome? Well, the way it worked in, in the town I came from is that the labor movement was a line drawn through the working class community. And it was an invitation for everybody who wanted to be decent, solidaristic, hopeful, uh, non, you know, fairly tolerant to be on this side. There was also wrong things because you could be on that side and you could still be committing domestic violence or child abuse. That, it was a hierarchical society. But to me, the equivalent now is, is, is to draw that line again through, through all human communities. Who wants the future? Who wants to combat climate change? Who wants to admit that science can be right, even if it's uncomfortable for us? And whose starting point is that all science which conflicts with their personal interest is bad? Who wants to defend the university? The right's number one aim, number one adversary. Uh, and, and I study in detail the, in the book the, the, the so-called neo-reactionary movement. Their number one adversary is the university. So for me, it's, it is a culture war. And in a culture war, of course, what you aim to, like all wars, you aim to dis disorganize the opposition. So yes, I want to give certain things to people who might vote for the Brexit party or the conservative ultra-Brexiteers in order to prevent them from becoming fascists. And, and, and ultimately, what's the end of the journey? It's Utoya in Norway. It's what happened in Christchurch. It's you know, the same... Thought architecture, unfortunately, is, is becoming more and more shared between quite mainstream right-wing thought and the guys who write the manifestos and then kill people. Now, it, it, what I want, to, what I want to, to try and bring back as many of those people as possible towards is the idea of the institutions. And they're not very left-wing institutions. Bourgeois democracy, universal human rights, and the rule of law. And for me... Um, it, you know, many leftists have kind of criticised this for saying, what do you mean, the rule of law? What do you mean, the universal declaration with all its Western bullshit? Yes, for me, because that's the important thing right now in history to defend. I, I mean, I can, it's just fire up. No, no, no. Just no. come on. No, I, there's so much more I'd like to, uh, to explore there. But I, I want to move on to another thing, which is one, one of the things that, that, that kind of made me smile in the book. Was this, this, you have this little kind of dance with Christianity. Um, and you mention it about, I don't know, about 10 times in the book. You kind of talk about Christianity and the Christian tradition and the Judeo-Christian tradition and Christian insights. But you do it in a way which I, I feel you're kind of doing it to make sure, in a way that doesn't get the reader worried at any stage that you are in this book going to have a kind of Damascene moment when you're going to say, it, so the solution is Jesus or whatever. So... Um, uh, um, it, what, but what interests me in that is, is when you talk about, you link the Christian tradition to the Aristotelian yeah. uh, virtue ethics, and you then link this to the notion of the good life. Yeah. But my favourite book about, about Christianity, I'm not a Christian, but my favourite book about Christianity is a book 
um, uh, called uh, Unapologetic by Francis Bufford. And Francis Bufford says in that book, uh, and excuse this because it's not past the watershed, um, he says Christianity is the religion for people who know they're going to fuck everything up. <laughs> so I'm kind of interested in the fact that you've got this kind of notion of human perfectibility in your book because you're a utopian, but yet the one thing Christianity teaches us above all else it is there is no oh. such possibility as human perfectibility. Okay, so the, the, the book is a Marxist book. Um, and it's not a cultural Marxist book in, this, in the way that the US right is obsessed with behavioural change and political correctness. It is, it is in this sense, a, a book of, in the Marxist humanist tradition of the people who've influenced me. Eric Fromm, from, uh, the, the psychologist of the 1930s, Rea Donayevskaya, who was Trotsky's secretary and became a kind of early autonomous Marxist. Uh, C.L.R. James, the, the, the Caribbean philosopher here. They're, they're the people who influenced me. And what, 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 what they represent in terms of a, a, the, the, the branching tree of left-wing thought is that when Marcuse and Adorno and the, and the Frankfurt School were saying, the working class has failed, therefore we need to find an, a substitute, feminism or black liberation theology, whatever, they said, the working class isn't, has always been a subset of the real agents of change, which is just angry human beings, you know, human beings with a vision of, of, of a better, of, of indeed a good life. Now, from that, um, the first thing I, I, you know, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to say about the whole Christian thing is that E.P. Thompson, who is also a humanist Marxist, Edward Thompson, for me the greatest English Marxist, said in his big critique of anti-humanist Marxism in the 1970s, it's called the, po uh, the, the, the poverty of theory, he says, look, there are two Marxisms and they're incompatible. We can't stop pretending, we've got to stop pretending that one leads to the gulag, one leads to, uh, to Louis Althusser's famous dictum that history is a process without a subject, i.e. a machine. Uh, and then the other leads to, to a, a philosophy of human freedom. And, and Thompson says something very, very dramatic. He says, if I'm wrong, my line of retreat is bourgeois liberalism and Christianity. Because the, w Marxism in this sense is, is a, a, a critical elaboration of these things. But Marx's early writings were all critiques of theories of right, of, of bourgeois legality. But they were built on it. He didn't want to go back to feudalism. Um, neither did he want to go back to a form of thinking that is pre-Aristotelian or uh, pre-Confucian, i.e. pure, you know, sun worship. We, we, Marxists, see all of these things as part of an intellectual advance. And Thompson said the bravest thing. He said, rather than become a Stalinist, I would rather be a Christian. Now, I, I'm happy to echo that, although I'm not about to become one. The, the other thing I say in the book is because I think there is a defensible radical humanism that is materialist, which is, which is humanist Marxism. The other thing I said in the book, the, 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 the fight against performativity begins here with you in the space between your face and your hand. Um, and one of, the, one of the models, there are other models, but one of the really interesting mod models are the early Christians. Now, the Marxist scholarship on early Christianity, it were, um, Geoffrey de Saint-Croix was the most famous Marxist um, historian of Christianity, when asked, what do you think about what the Romans did to the Christians? He used to say, too little, too late. Um, he was on that other side of Marxism. I say, you know, uh, look at the way that they refused performativity. They were offered the chance, as we were offered the chance, just, just keep your, your crazy humanistic religion to yourself, um, obey our gods, just don't get this book out in public and you'll be all right. And they said, no, we, we'd rather die than perform to your strictures. I think that's a good example. Of course, the reason why I keep saying I'm not a Christian is because I'm not, and I don't want people to think that that, that in is, is in some way you know, an excuse to, to, to blend uh, the secular philosophy of Marxism and materialism back into its Judeo-Christian uh, origin. And it's, look, the reason I use the word Judeo-Christian is, of course, the, the thought patterns are Judeo-Islamo-Christian. If, if you look at the way that Aristotelian thought came via the Islamic golden age but, but into I, our thoughts. So yeah. that is because, yes, I think that, that humanism is an outcropping of that, so, and I want to defend it. Yeah, but that, in a sense, that's not the, 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 the point I'm trying to get to. The point I'm trying to get to is that the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions yes. in the sense that... Yeah. The kind of no, the utopian notion that if we can create the right society, everybody will be in a state of bliss. Well, 
right? Uh, I don't think I say that. No, well, no, no, but you don't. It, but you are a utopia. You do argue that there can be a state of society in which human beings will have the good life. And in a sense, implicitly in that, that, that all the kind of travails and miseries and contradictions, I'm, you know, I'm a bit, of, I'm a bit with Freud in mm. some of, you know, the, the fact that parts of our personality systematically attack each other, that, that kind of, that in some way this will go. And what worries me about that is that I think one of the roots to totalitarianism is that, is that, is that radicals create societies and they expect people to be happy. And when people aren't happy, they turn on yeah. the people who aren't happy and say, yeah. right, you yeah. bastards, I'm going to make you happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, and, that, that, and that is a root. Yeah, that, that is a that, root. So that, what worries me slightly is because you, when you talk about Christianity, you don't pick out this element of Christianity, which is about the fact that we are flawed, we are fallen, mm. and all of this. And therefore, in your utopia, I worry that you're, I'm not going to be allowed to be the miserable git that I am. No, well, I, I think should, should, should I might write a little instruction to any of my minions <laughs> in 100 years' time who've read this book and become a cult around Paul Mason. Let him off. Uh, but... So, look, th that, that critique of utopian thought you know, has to be something that... You know, when I say utopian, what do I mean? I mean, I, th I have a teleological view of human, of human nature. That is, from the, from the biological attributes that we know more and more about, Marx just guessed at them, but evolutionary biology tells us more and more about the, the fine differences between us and, and higher primates. And, and, and I think that... From these attributes, it is possible to conclude that, yeah, we can either destroy ourselves or we can... It's, it's socialism or barbarism. I don't use the word socialism, but it's the equivalent of socialism or barbarism. Or that we... It's not a question of perfecting. I never use the word perfecting a human being, nor even perfecting society. Marx once wrote, once wrote that when you get to a classless society, that's the beginning of human history. Um, and indeed, that one of the sci-fi's... Um, writers I, 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 I quote in here, has a huge, um, Olaf Stapledon, has a huge, um, was an amazing Hegelian thinker and philosopher, and writes this, uh, this, 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 this sci-fi book about human evolution beyond, beyond Homo sapien, um, which is a product of, of quasi-class struggles over, over, over things that we can't even guess will exist in, say, a thousand years' time. So I'm not, I'm not saying that we'll reach a, or it's possible for us to reach a, a permanent uh, stasis. What, what, I do, uh, what I think it is legitimate for, for, to say, and, and my argument with the left is to raise their game to this, is to say, you know, given we've gone from you know, three, 300,000 years from stone tools to, to uh, steam engines, and 200 years from steam engines to silicon, thips, uh, silicon chips four nanometers thick, um, there is, there is a, a case for optimism. There is a case for saying technological change and human self-advancement can take us quite a long way further if we can overcome this phase of the reactions against it. Or rather, the, the, that process always creates, because it, it exists within a hierarchical society, it always creates counterblasts to it. I do think that, you know, you remember the Jules Rimet trophy, what was it called, the, um, the, the World Cup? If you won it... Three times you kept it. Brazil won it three times and they kept the trophy. If we defeat fascism twice in a hundred years, we, we'll be able to keep democracy. Because we've got a very highly educated, in the West anyway, in the developed world, uh, population. And I think we do, there are grounds for, for, for thinking if we defeat it again, we can actually move to a higher level in which it, it, it's much harder for it to come back. So last question before I open it up. Um, this isn't a book with a kind of detailed route map to um, socialism although it does end with a set of principles by which we should think about our lives and, and how we organise. But what appears to emerge by the end of the book, Paul, is a kind of almost an organic model of change. Yeah. So it's just a kind of interpersonal, gradually building up social experimentation, yeah? and gradually going to build up our capacity yeah. to en envisage and to enact a different society. Now, kind of like the South, South America's Paul Mason, Roberto Unger, uh, who I follow his work very carefully. Yeah. You know. Now, he, he argues very strongly, and has always argued, is his kind of best tune. You know, he argues that you have to have a kind of radicalism in terms of the vision, but a highly experimental and yeah. agile and adaptive methodology to get there. Right? Mm. Now, it's, I sense within the Corbyn project two very different models of yeah. change wrestling. And I just want to ask you both, because nobody yeah. knows that project better than you. There is a kind of dirigiste top-down, nationalise lots of stuff, state control, spend lots of money, 
I'm not saying any of those things individually are problematic, but there's a kind of, that's the way we'll do it. It's a, it's a, it's a huge top-down transformation in society, and in a sense, the cultural, social, interpersonal things will solve themselves as a consequence of that. Yeah. And then there's an alternative model, which I think you, know, you hear a bit more from kind of McDonald acolytes and others, which is, and people in local government, which is more like yours. It's kind of organic, yeah. experimental. It might take a bit longer, but it's got to build up. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be real. Mm. Is, am I right in sensing that? You, you're, abs you're absolutely right. And for me, they, let's be absolutely honest, they, they, they conform to both to the two Marxisms and that the, the reflection of those two Marxisms is within social democracy. Because you know, within British social democracy, you know, morning, the Morning Star newspaper, you know, uh, you know, it's still very, in, uh, very influential. But so are, so is humanistic Thompson style Marxism it has pervaded right the way up, I would argue, right into the, into the sort of ranks of, of lifelong social democrats. Okay, so the argument is about that. The current argument between me and Corbyn is over remain and reform yeah. and second referendum yeah. versus what he's trying to do. But, and I think that my, my, uh, my support for him was, all, was always on the basis we, we're gonna need, need several iterations of, of left social democracy before we get it right. This was the, the, the one that replaced something that wasn't working. So your model is more organic and his is more mechanical. I'm not asking well, you to criticize no, Corbyn no, for I'll, some I'll, cheap, I'll, cheap I'll, point scoring, I'll, but I mean, actually, the, you know, the account actually, of the world. Uh, uh, the, my account of the world is one influenced by autom autonomism, that is the idea that we build from below. Um, because I see this as a long transition, like the transition from feudalism to capitalism, say, you know, we're at the sort of, you know, du we're, we're not even at the Dutch Republic, you know, 1614 stage, but we've got some of the bits and bobs, we've got open source software, we've got um, the more networked human being. The, Brecht says this amazing thing about Shakespeare. Shakespeare was writing about a new kind of human being. Well, I write about a new kind of human being. We've got the, a bit of the new kind of human being, and we can, out of this, we, we create islands of autonomy, islands of self-reliance, islands of abundance, you know, using uh, open source and, and, and free stuff. Uh, the solidarity economy in Germany is quite a good example of that. Barcelona under Adekolao, up for re-election this, 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 this week is a good example of the beginnings of what might lead us to a kind of Dutch Republic first iteration of a kind of post-capitalist transition. But yes, it is gradual. And for me, I mean, you have to read my other book, Post-Capitalism, to, 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 to get the grips with this. It, for me, all those things about state control and planning are, they're not so much optional, but they're for individual pieces of the project plan. Uh, climate change is the one I think we're going to have to do in, a, in, a, in an overtly top-down way. I just think we're going to have to seize, uh, sequester, and, 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 and decommission the, 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 the energy, the, the climate, the fossil-based energy system. But for the rest of it, yes, I do see a, a prolonged transition. Um, my influence, on it, such as it is, uh, has produced things like the alternative forms of ownership uh, report that, 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 that Corbyn commissioned, um, so mutuals, co-ops, etc. And, and the other part of it, just to finish, is you look at the PLP, you look at Corbyn, it's operating in a way that the institution it operate, it, it, the, the institution demands of parliament and parliamentary politics demand in a way. And, and it's unfortunate because it means you can never even tell the truth. If you've lost an election, you have to pretend you nearly won it. I mean, it, that's the way politics works. But if you then look at something like the World Transformed Festival, which I've had an influence in, in trying to curate and, and form, um, which is a 6,000 strong politics festival that happens now year, every year alongside Labour Conference, that's where the, the thousand flowers are blooming and where the battles, the, the ideas are, are fluctuating. And, you know, I mean, they, the sub had a go at us for having a socialist crash. You know what I mean? But, but, you know, since we had to have a crash, we thought we'd do it in a, in a, a kind of radical way. But, yeah, that... that um, I don't think that the ideas in this book are solely the property of, of a social democrat, though. I think that, the, uh, for me, it's, if, it, if it's anything political, it's the basis for a political confluence between social democracy, radical social democracy, parts of liberalism, and of course parts of these, these incredibly vibrant you know, left nationalisms that ex exist in Europe, and the movements, Me Too, uh, BLM, uh, XR, they, these are things that need to come together, not under the kind of lectern of Paul Mason with his shonky PowerPoint presentation, but they'll just do it themselves. And what I'm trying to do is to provide a, an idea set, a kind of manual for how you fight the, the next bit of what we have to fight, which is for 
uh, the culture war against the alt-right, and the war for control of the emergent artificial intelligences, which to me can only be done on the basis of what the book is subtitled for, the, the radical defense of the human being. Let, let's, take some, let's take some questions. There's, a, uh, there's one there. Uh, wait, wait for the mic to come to you. If you can tell us your name, that would be great. Yep. Thank you. Uh, John Bailey. Thanks, Paul. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, and I think Matthew touched on it obliquely, you mentioned theatre. Yeah. And I wondered what you thought about the arts in terms of um, being a progressive force against some of the, the points you raise in the nature and the way in which we're breaking up as a society. Does it have any role to play, we'll particularly take, the theatre? We'll take two or three together, although I get an email from somebody after every event saying, why do you take two or three together? But I'm going to carry on doing it. Martin? Hi. Um, I liked a lot of what you're saying. I'm, I'm very interested in, in one particular thing which I want to unpick, and that is what is a human being in yeah. your eyes? You're talking about from a materialist point of view, and a lot of what you're saying is all these forces that make the human do various things. What does the human do? And then where do I do? Is there a third question? Yes, there is back there. Good afternoon. Uh, Rob Cameron. Um, you've talked a lot about individualism and hum humanism and, and, and the, the battle between that on the one hand, the far right, and al algorithmic technologies. And you can see those playing out as two. What about the role of China, where you have culture war potential as well as technical war as well as economic conflict? Great. So take those three as quickly as you can so we can take in three reverse more. Or, in reverse order. I, I, so there's a whole chapter in this book called Reject the Thoughts of Xi Jinping, which is guaranteed to not really put it on the top of the Amazon's kind of list in China itself. <laughs> Some of my other books circulate in, in, in Samin's data, actually, which I'm really proud of, in, in, the, in the PRC. Um, Xi Jinping is pioneering algorithmic control. In Xinjiang right now, uh, with the compulsory DNA, face recognition, etc., for the Communist Party itself, which is a 2% slice through society, now being forced to watch videos, answer questions on, about them on their cell phones, timed as to whether they answer. Soon they will have the social credit system. You know, it, it sounds dystopian. Let's see what, what they actually do. Already, 18 countries outside China have imported uh, population management software from China. So, you know, just as say in, in, the, in, in the 70s in Northern Ireland, one of the reasons the left was really critical of the, of the army and the police in Northern Ireland was we always said, one day they'll use this technology against us, even if only for a, the selfish reason of one day we don't want the technology used against us. We have to critique it where it is. That's that, in brief. The other thing I say about Xi and his Marxism, because he's now made Marxism again into the state ideology, for Marxists like me, it becomes doubly important to distance ourselves from, but analyse in a way which we can, because we are the kind of experts on it, what this is. And it is absolutely, from day one, it is a classic anti-humanist uh, mechanistic form of ideology. Now, coming to the question of theatre, um, you may not know, but when I went freelance from, from Channel 4 News, one of the things I decided to do was to try and write drama and theatre. And I've actually, two of my plays have been performed. One of them was funded by and staged by the BBC at the, at the Young Vic called Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere. So I was in it and I was narrating it. The BBC loved it so much that they put it on at 10.30 uh, one night, um, many months after it had been on, and it's never been on again. <laughs> and, it's not, and it's unavailable. Uh, but um, there is a little secret YouTube link, uh, which if I could remember the URL, I could tell you. But um, I tried to write, uh, to move it to, into, to, to diversify the ways in which I was storytelling. To me, everything is journalism, telling the story of what I see in different community forms. Now, in the process of doing this, I've become more and more convinced that cultural production will be a, is, is an underestimated aspect of the transition I want to carry out. People always ask, well, what will we do if we only have six-hour days or four-day weeks? And I think there'll be cultural producers and consumers. Uh, working with actors, it, it, it was revealed to me that what actors do during the day is they sit in the lobbies of theatres um, drinking coffee and discussing other people's work for free. That, that they are exchanging, I mean, it's a terrible, poor life being an actor, but it, they're exchanging being a barista or something, you know, being a, a, an Amazon worker for the quality of life that it gives you to be in a, an almost continuous cultural environment. Um, and I have since time immemorial. And yet, you know, the billion pounds the Arts Council England probably spends, like, just less than a billion, I now see as 
something that I would be pushing within politics, as to, just as much as I want to say, you know, raise, you know, sort of, there's always like a tar defense spending target of 2% of GDP. I think we should have a, a, a cultural spend target. I don't know what it should be, but what, what its effect should be would be to create cultural uh, sp little areas of disruption where anybody interested in them to, could come to, exactly like John Maynard Keynes more or less imagined when he set the Arts Council up. Keynes' idea for the Arts Council was that the money would be for anybody who's producing culture, you know, local choirs. Well, that's what Keynes thought, influenced by the Bloomsbury Group, influenced by Roger Fry, etc., and his ideas of beauty. I think that's going to be incredibly important for the transition I want. As we go to your question about what, 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 is, what is the human being part of it, I, I, I mean, I, I'm simply, um, I, I am simply, in this sense, a, a, a classic Marxist. I just believe that, that, as Marx said, it's not homo economicus, it's not zoon politicon, or it is that. It's n if Marx had thought we were defined by work, he would have used the term Benjamin Franklin, our neighbour here, uh, used, which is homo faber. But instead he used the German Gattungswesen, uh, species being. It is a species evolved to, from the get-go, conceive of all its actions in terms of the other members of the species. Now, you may you argue against that, uh, and some anti-humanist Mar Marxists do. Uh, I, I think that um, that is my view, uh, and I think it is arguable, f it, is, it is logically arguable from the biological attributes of the human being that we know about, and what we know about the what we know now, and it can always be disproven because science changes every minute, but what we know now about evolutionary biology suggests that Marx's intuition about who we are was pretty accurate. We've got very, we might have time for a very quick round. Is there, are there any women? We've had no yeah. women voices at all in the whole process. Do you want to ask a question? I want to ask a question. No, no, okay. I think I saw one. Oh, there's a, there's a hand right at the back. There's two hands that are kind of parallel. One's on the back wall and one's just sitting down. Yeah, great. Um, Hello. Yeah, given that um, Nancy Pelosi, on the one hand, has said she's willing to kind of give tens of millions of dollars to Trump's wall, but on the other hand, uh, Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal is unrealistic, why do you think the left can form a, a coalition, as you say, with the kind of centrist neoliberals, if they're kind of against social transformation, but for kind of maintaining a system um, which can often lead to kind of alignment with the far right? Okay, and then I think just in front of you, uh, very briefly if we can, because we're running out of time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. In determining the future of uh, humanity, what role do the conspiracy theories play? <laughs> um, can they, do they have power to alter the course of humanity, or they tend to be neutralized? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, look, there's, there's not enough time to go through the, the role of conspiracy theories, to, but to say, I think that... We, we aren't just facing a spontaneous, as it were, pernicious um, attribute of this disorientated character that I described. Um, we are also facing a, a century-old mechanism of Soviet and now post-Soviet disinformation. And, and uh, the experts in it, just to describe it as the evil doctor theory, a, a good doctor looks at your body and says, you've got a bad hip, you've got a dodgy heart, you know, you, a squinty eye, How, what can we do to put them right? Evil doctor says, how can we make them worse? And, and what, you know, from the Okhrana under Tsarism to the KGB to now, the FSB, the Russian state is just very good at looking at Western society and saying, how can we make all its diseases worse? And I think that one of them is, is the conspiracy theory. But... Inside the labour movement, where, where I do my activism, I know that there is a lot of conspiracy theories. And, and what, where it comes from, in, apart from the, whoever's pumping it out, when I look at the people on Twitter who are amplifying it, it's always powerless people. It's always people who are, who wouldn't, who've never been in a place like this, never met you, never met most of you, and, and they assume that everything is... Because everything does feel stacked against them, from the DWP, where they're going to claim their benefits, to, to everything that why wouldn't the intelli information system be stacked against them as well? Now, on the question of um, the left and the centre, let's say that Nancy Pelosi is the centre, and she most definitely is, and, 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 and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is the left. 
I, I, I think the, the climate issue is the one issue where, where I'm the most hopeful because the thing about the centre is that they believe science. And in fact, they, are, they own science, you know, in, this, in the sense that the public figures, there's not many Trotskyists and Marxists. There are a few uh, associated with high science in, in, in Britain, but, but, but the centre has been a, and this institution, I think, is in a way a reflection of that, has been a, a, a place where science is, 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 is held to be important. So I think that, I think we can convince Nancy Pelosi of the need to decarbonise the world according to the way the IPCC report demands that we do it. Um, the, the issue is whether we can, com whether, whether we can, uh, whether we can convince the centre to be, to prioritise enough and to make the difficult choices that they're going to have to make because it's going to need massive fiscal uh, invest, you know, massive fiscal transfers. Number one and huge debts. Uh, huge debts that will have to be uh, accrued, a lot of money printing, and mainstream economics tells the centre not to do it. Uh, and I want to, you know, I want to try and convince them to do that. Ocasio Cortez's problem, meanwhile, is that first she hasn't reached the stage where she really gets the Corbyn treatment. You know, we, when, we, you'll know what that is when it comes. Um, but th the bigger problem is right now that section of the American left that can see the need for radical transformation is deluded by a bunch of theories that tell them that it doesn't matter if American, if American debt is you know, 300% of GDP or whether the central bank's printed money. You know, there are pe pe quite serious academics uh, allied to Sanders and Cortez who will tell them you can just print enough money to pay off the national debt tomorrow and pay it off. Now, my fear is that actually I want, that's not going to convince Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Nancy Pelosi, it won't convince middle America. And it's quite interesting to, for, to be a participant in that debate, and via Trans the Atlantic I am, uh, to be somebody trying to pull the American left into the, into the world of, uh, of the realistic risks that arise from radical action. And then the polemic I've written against them, and to finish, it is basically saying, look, we, the Marxists, have been there before. We had a facile theory about um, state planning. We said, look, you know, um, we're giddy with success. If you remember, that was Stalin's famous um, phrase at the beginning, at the end of the first five-year plan. We know what abstract utopian thinking about economic transformation can do. So let's, let's risk assess it. Let's do it prudently. But on that basis, we can all, I think we can construct that alliance. I think the, the, the climate change emergency will be, in a way, the vehicle in, around which all of the, the, the fight against the far right, the, the struggle for the soul of the centre, and the struggle for realism on the left, it will be the arena in which, which all those conflicts are probably resolved. Well, thank you, Paul. I'm, I, I pride myself on finishing on time, but uh, if ever there was an excuse for not finishing on time, it, it's listening to you. So um, uh, if you want to hear more of Paul's uh, thoughts, and we've really just scraped the surface, then do get a copy of um, this uh, wonderful book, uh, which is available outside, and Paul will uh, sign it for you, even though that's a kind of quasi-fetishistic act, it is. I think. Um, uh, uh, but it just remains for me to uh, ask you to join me in thanking Paul Mason. Thank you so much. Thank you.